Hi, everyone. Get ready for the How I Raised It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Michael Kim of Sendana Capital, a fund of funds that has invested in dozens of early stage venture funds. So if you're interested in starting your own venture fund today or someday, this episode is going to be golden. It will give you the playbook of how to raise capital for a venture fund. Even if you're a startup founder, understanding where VCs get their money from can help you understand how venture capital works. So hopefully it's valuable to you. If you enjoy this conversation, I would be personally grateful if you hit the like and subscribe button and leave us a nice comment in the comments section. And if you do so, email us at info at foundersuite.com and I will send you a list of 20 of the most active fund of funds out there today. This could be a great starting point for building your own fund. For now, thank you. Sit back and enjoy the chat with Michael. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Michael Kim of Sendana Capital coming to us from San Francisco. How's your day going? Great. Nice to nice to be here. Great, great, great. Um, well, let's jump right into it. Your kid has a coding class you've got to get him to, so operating under that timeline, what is Sendana Capital? That's a very like a very San Francisco thing to do, right? You've got to get your kid to your coding class. I love it. <laughs> Um, well, so Sendana Capital is an investment management firm. We have about a billion four under management. I'm the founder. I started it about 10 years ago. And what we do is in, uh, basically two lines of businesses. So our uh, predominant line of business is to actually is a fund of funds. So we actually raise capital ourselves and then take that capital and, and invest it in venture capital firms. And specifically, we are focused at the seed stage. So I think we're still the only group worldwide that is exclusively focused at the seed stage. And we can go into why, why that's an interesting opportunity and how that's developed. This, uh, uh, the other line of business is that we actually invest directly into the portfolio companies of our fund managers. So that's a much smaller uh, part of what we do. Uh, we invest typically in 18 to 20 companies every few years. And um, that, that strategy has worked really well. Um, and it's a real testament to our, uh, fund managers. Yeah. What's the quick backstory or Genesis? What were you doing before? And I guess was the thesis simply that, Hey, there's an opportunity of investing in this emerging right. seed venture fund class or what's the, the Genesis. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, in, in college, uh, I want, I wanted to actually become a diplomat. You know, my father's family was in the, in government service in Korea and um, so I studied international relations. I decided to go to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown for a master's degree to become a diplomat. And then I had this epiphany that, well, I don't necessarily want to climb the government ladder for 20 years. Um, maybe one day I can be appointed something. So I decided to go into banking. And I started off at Chase Manhattan Bank uh, doing credit analysis on corporate, on, you know, on corporate clients. Um, my friends over in the investment banks like Goldman or Morgan Stanley seem to be working on more interesting projects. So I decided to go to business school and uh, to make a, sort of that career change. So I went to Wharton, got a summer internship at Morgan Stanley. So uh, that was my dream job. I was super happy. My second year of business school went really well because I had a, a full-time offer in hand. And so August of 1997, I started Morgan Stanley full time, and then in, in New York, and then one month later, there was an opening in San Francisco for the technology M and A team. And so this is, you know, this was the team that was facilitating the first internet bubble. I, I suppose um, it was a really busy time, you know, 1997 to 2000, and um, and and concurrently to that. One of my friends at, at the firm actually was um, uh, working to start a venture capital firm. And so there was a family office in uh, Los Angeles called the Chandlers. And the Chandler family is um, an old, media, old school media family that owned the LA Times and then ultimately sold that to Tribune. Um, and so they, they kicked off uh, an investment program and I joined that as a partner. 
I was based in San Francisco. We were making early stage investments. Um, by 2003, uh, the mayor at the time, Gavin Newsom, actually, uh, I was the co-chair of his finance committee. Hmm. And when he became mayor, appointed me to uh, the board of San Francisco's public pension fund, which is called San Francisco Employee Retirement System. Um, and, you know, at the time, it was about a $12 billion pension fund. I, I rotated through roles like being chairman of the investment committee. I was president of the board. It was a five-year appointment. It was a volunteer job. That was actually the first time I was on the LP side of the table, meaning I was helping um, the retirement system select managers, thinking about asset allocation, you know, a little bit to equities, a little bit to fixed income, a little bit to private markets, which is typically private equity and venture capital. So by the time I turned 40 in 2008, I decided I wanted to start my own firm. And so I left my, um, my venture capital firm in 2010 and launched Sundana. Um, what I would say is that, you know, when I was at, in venture capital, I saw two, two predominant trends since the late nineties. Number one, it became a lot cheaper to start a company, sure. literally an order of magnitude less. So if you remember in 1999 to start a software company, you needed $5 million because you had to buy Sun Microsystems servers. You had to pay for software licenses. Sure. Um, now order of magnitude less, 500K, Amazon Web Services, open source software. Uh, uh, you can start an enterprise software company for, uh, for that, uh, uh, you know, a substantially less. Uh, upfront capital. The other major dynamic was that the multi-stage VC funds were getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, so there was, a, uh, you know, a lot of them were 500 million to a billion. And so there was an opportunity cost of those general partners spending any time on a small investment. So in the early 2000s, you saw firms like Union Square Ventures, Foundry, True Ventures. In the mid 2000s, you saw groups like First Round Capital. And yeah. then by the late 2000s, you saw you know, what they were calling super angels, you know, uh, full-time investors who were using their own capital becoming more institutional, meaning yeah. that they were taking outside capital and managing outside, uh, you know, uh, institutional LP um, capital. And so, you know, when I started Sindana in 2010, I, I think there are probably 10 to 15 seed funds. And now today there's probably over a thousand in mm -hmm. the US alone. And so I think we were pretty prescient in, in identifying seed venture as ultimately becoming de facto early stage venture. And what I mean by that is, you know, today a series A is 15 to $20 million on a hundred million valuation. And, um, you know, seed rounds today are more like three to 4 million on, you know, $15 million kind of valuation. So, you know, the, the seed markets evolved since when I started Sundana. Um, but I think the, 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 the key takeaway is that, you know, we were early in identifying the space as something very, very attractive and, um, you know, created a, a, a vehicle so that large institutional investors can access the space. Yeah, really interesting. So I want to get into the fund and how you pick uh, fund managers to invest in. But before we get there, because this show is about how, uh, you know, how you raise capital, how did right. you raise capital for um, your Our fund to fund originally yeah. and, and today? Yeah. I mean, it was a real struggle. Um, it took me over 18 months to raise the first fund. 99.99% um, .99 of the people I pitched said no. And it was always hard to tell whether, you know, to actually get a, a, a fast no, of course, is always the best. But, um, you know, we would go and have multiple meetings and just get radio silence and just not know where we were, where we stood with different groups. And so it was very challenging and it was, I was the only one working on it. I was the sole GP. I didn't have a team and uh, I would do all the meetings myself. And, you know, before zoom, we would have to do these in-person meetings or telephone calls. And so it was, um, it, it, there's a lot more friction around meeting a lot of people. Um, who, who are you going after? Was it family offices or high net worth or larger LPs, pension funds, yeah. teachers, retirement stuff? That was a great question. Uh, you know, largely endowments and foundations. I, I didn't really go after pension funds because they're much larger. Uh, it's a much longer process. Um, mm -hmm. And and so, you know, family offices is, 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 as well. But it's very difficult, actually, to access family offices because 
you know, they, they prefer to be, uh, to have someone they trust make a very warm introduction. And so there's no real easy way to go cold call family offices. Um, and so I was really fortunate that one of my friends actually introduced me to a family office in Philadelphia, one that I'd never met before. I pitched the idea. They really liked the, 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 the concept. And I was, you know, we basically agreed that they would warehouse commitments that I would make. And that actually, to be honest, was a very significant turning point and, um, you know, in the trajectory of what I was doing, because you can imagine I'm just getting people saying no, no, no. And then this family office says, you know, it's a really good idea. We'll give you up to $18 million to go and make commitments to funds. And so I started making commitments to fund to, to portfolio funds. And what that really did was transform me from a PowerPoint to a real fund. And it actually helped because other LPs could now then call those portfolio funds and say, hey, why are you working with Sendana? And so that really was very strong validation. And then the other fortunate sort of inflection point was the University of Texas, which is one of the largest endowments in the US. They, they presently have about $50 billion. They really wanted to get into the seed space, but mm -hmm. as, as a $50 billion pension you know, endowment, they, they have to write really large checks. They have to write $100 million plus checks. Yeah. And so yeah. there wasn't a way for them to access these sort of 30, 40, $50 million seed funds. So we worked, we, we, uh, we negotiated a, um, a solution where they became uh, uh, our largest investor. And um, so all told, I raised about 90 million in 2012. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you, uh, it was really, really, really hard. Interesting. So let's fast forward now. If you did a quick pie chart of your total uh, LP base, sort of right. how's the, what are the three or four major categories? Sure. Yeah. So um, as mentioned, the University of Texas is our largest investor. They have 260 million with us. Um, we have a lot of endowments and foundations. Um, we, you know, one would be, for example, the, the, the Getty Museum in LA. Mm. They have an, yeah. a, an endowment and they're one of our largest investors and from the beginning. Um, there's a group called Cambridge Associates, which is a consulting firm to um, endowments and foundations and family offices. And they have a, a, a number of their clients with us. So, you know, gr groups like the NPR, um, you know, the National Public Radio Foundation, mm -hmm. um, like uh, the Gerber Foundation, which does pediatric research um, in Michigan, or the Children's Hospital Wisconsin. Um, so we have a number of not-for-profits like that, a lot of them are in the healthcare space, so cancer research foundations, cardiothoracic uh, research foundations, and then of course we have family offices. Um, so you know some of these family offices are multi-billion in size. And one one interesting thing that developed out of this is that uh, a handful of family offices work with us because they want access to deal flow. So whether it's in accessing uh, our portfolio funds to invest directly, or actually companies that emanate from our portfolio funds yeah. where they can potentially invest. These family offices can make a direct investment into the company. All right. One more question on that. And then I want to shift to the focus of the, the new fund. But if you were, um, this is the question I ask everyone, if you were to give your younger self advice on, you know, uh, uh, going back in time to 2010, 2012, uh, what would it be? Or any general tips for a, if you were advising someone who wants to start a fund of funds, general tips for raising money from endowments and foundations, any kind of just general advice for someone starting a fund to fund, basically. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, so one element of this, uh, uh, the origin story is that I actually uh, raised a small pool of capital uh, to provide me runway. And so in a way um, I raised my own seed round, I raised a million dollars and, you know, I knew that it was going to take a long time to, um, to raise the first fund. And so I wanted to actually be prepared and have my family prepared. My wife was super supportive of this. And, um, you know, I actually had a, a three-year-old child at the time. Uh, this was back in 2010. So, you know, a lot of pressure, right? Um, being an entrepreneur, creating a new, um, via, a, a new firm. It was very, very difficult, to be honest. And, you know, I think um, the advice I give is that, um, you know, would actually be to press people for a fast no. 
Mm. I think that unknown was actually causing a lot of stress, whether, you know, so imagine you give a, 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 you pitch a group and they're smiling and they're nodding and they say, this sounds great. And then let's do another call. So we do another call two weeks later, go a little bit more into detail. That sounds great. And then radio silence, right? And so it's that unknown that I think causes a lot of stress. And so for anybody who's about to invest, whether it's an individual or even us, if we're about to, if we're engaged with, with a potentially new fund, you know, I think a fast no is, is something that you should ask for. I mean, just, a, a, you know, you, you, you want to really suss out um, how that, that person that you're pitching really feels. And, you know, a lot of them may not, there's, there's, a, there's sort of optionality in people waiting and yep. seeing how things progress. And so you've got to really catalyze something. And then there's that one more element. I think it's a psychological one. And it applies to so many things. It's switching from fear to greed. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is, you know, for a startup, if you're pitching 20 VC firms and they're all just sitting on their hands and then suddenly Sequoia decides to lead the round, all of them are going to pile in and try to get a slice of that round. Um, it, so, so you went from fear of, of those groups just not wanting to make them uh, do something stupid to greed because you, they, they all want to get in. Um, and so I think if you're a, a, a new fund trying to raise capital, having a first close is very, very important because again, um, you're, you're, you're becoming, you're, you're, you're moving from a PowerPoint to being a real fund. Yeah. And so, you, you know, you're, you're ultimately creating scarcity value, meaning, you know, if there's capital already in the fund and if, because of you did a first close, then people have to, you know, that catalyzes people to, into action. They have to actually just make a decision on whether to, to, to do the work and ultimately invest or not. So yeah. I think it's that fear to greed, fear moving to greed is sort of the fulcrum that you, uh, that any, in, in, in anything that you'd want to do. Um, and, and actually being able to identify the levers around that is, is super important. Just quickly on the, on the fast no is, do you, you set a deadline for people to make a decision or do you simply ask, Hey, I would really appreciate it if you could make a decision quickly. Cause people do tend to drag out as long as you let them as, do you right. have any magic question to ask that fast? No, <laughs> that's, that's a super good question. That's a great question. Um, because part of me, when I was raising my first fund and even now I, it, it's hard it, it, I, for me, I guess maybe it's intrinsic to me. It's hard to ask for the order. I guess is one way to say it. And I think salespeople are really good at it. They, they, they say, hey, you know, let's make a decision here. Um, for me, you know, it, it's a little bit harder saying, well, because I can recognize that they may want some more time to think about things. So I don't want to push them too fast. And, you know, I think if you push someone too hard, obviously they'll just say, hey, it's not fit for us right now. But in reality, that's probably a better answer than just sitting around wondering if they're going to do anything. So I think... You know, not I wouldn't give a deadline, but I think I would just try to articulate the reasons why it's important to know whether it's a fit or not. And if not, probably just as importantly to maintain that relationship, because in in two years when you're raising your next fund, it may be a fit. And so you never yeah. want to burn bridges, and of, of course. And you you know, it may not be a fit now, but it might be a fit down the road. And it it it, it I think it behooves everyone to you know keep those relationships warm. Yeah, great. All right, this is super interesting. Let's shift gears to talking about the, I guess, the Sendana Nano Fund. And if I'm paraphrasing this from TechCrunch, it's thirty million dollar fund to invest in twelve pre-seed, seed, and pre-seed managers. Correct. Right. Yeah. So you know, I think we, we, what we were seeing over the last two years is that you know these small first-time funds. And we, we, we've been meeting with them uh, over you know, the past 10 years. They would say, hey, I'm raising $10 million. Um, and what we would say is, well, you know, we typically write 15 and $20 million checks. And so let's stay in touch when you're raising your second fund, and then we can really engage. And you know, I think there are some things that have been evolving in, in the seed stage investment, in, in seed stage venture that really catalyze this idea of the Sendana Nano. And so, you know, we're folk that that vehicle is focused on sub $15 million funds. Okay. 
Okay. Um, we've been seeing a lot of fund managers who are actually full-time operators. You know, a good example would be Ryan Hoover, who was the CEO and founder of Product Hunt. You know, he was doing that full time, but he had his fund, the weekend fund. And, you know, in our main fund, we would never consider someone who's not full time, right? Uh, it's institutional capital. We, if we're writing a $20 million check to someone, we want them this, we want, you know, investing to be their full time job. Yep. But we were seeing that there are a lot of these sort of operators who um, had great access to companies. And in fact, founders wanted them on the cap table because of their operating experience. And, you know, they weren't going to become full-time, full-time fund managers, but they might have a $10 million fund. Um, another element of, that we were seeing is that, you know, someone like Kevin Novak, who was uh, employee 21 at Uber, chief data scientist, oversaw their data teams, invented surge pricing, you know, he could have raised a $100 million fund, but instead he wanted to raise a $15 million fund and, um, you know, focus on writing three to $400,000 investments. Because if you become a $100 million fund, then you have to start leading your investments. Then you have to start writing two to $3 million checks. And then you have to start throwing elbows in order yeah. to be able to write that check because all the other seed funds are going to try to get that position as well. So, you know, and, and then from a returns perspective, you know, Chris Saka, lowercase one, $8 million, 200X, all-time best fund return. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were seeing that in our own portfolio. We were seeing a firm like Manu Kumar, K9 Ventures, you know, his first fund was six, six million and, you know, he, it's over 50X or Mucker Capital down in LA, first mm -hmm. fund was 12 million over 20 X. And so, you know, we were seeing that substantial alpha substantial value was being created by these small funds. And um, so for those different reasons, we decided we wanted to create something because our main fund would not be able to capture those opportunities. Yeah. Cool. So $15 million fund. And will you typically be the first check-in? Are you kind of taking that role that was it Chandler or you, 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 Texas played with your first fund of being that sort of, Hey, these guys are legit. Or are you waiting till they've closed some of that fund already? Um, well, so typically we're not social proof investors. We're happy to be the first check, you know, with when Kirsten Green was raising her first fund Forerunner one, which was 40 million, we committed $10 million to her. We were the first to commit. And, you know, we just believed in Kirsten. Um, and, uh, you know, but what I would say is that practically speaking, a lot of these small funds, you know, five, $10 million funds, they're already in the process of raising capital. They probably got commitments from their friends and family of a small amount. And so I would say that um, we're, you know, and, and pretty much no institution is looking at them, right? They're yeah. at best, they're going to get a large family office to commit to them. Um, and, you know, so what I would say is that someone like Jeff Morris Jr., he was almost done fundraising and we ended up uh, anchoring his, his fund. We wrote $2 million to his $10 million fund. So our nano program is specifically so that we can be 20% of, 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 of a fund. So like Kevin right. Novak, yeah. we wrote 3 million. Um, what I will tell you though, Nathan, is that once, once, that, uh, once we launched this fund, my inbox went to about 900 emails a day. And now I'm not talking spam, 900 like work emails because wow. it seems like everybody and their sister now has a $5 million fund. And, and we, we want to know what's going on in the world. So we actually try to meet with all of them. Um, and, you know, not, notwithstanding my earlier comments about a fast no, it's hard actually even to just to start uh, stacking meetings um, into our calendars. Uh, our calendars have blown up. Our inboxes have blown up. Um, but I do think it's going to be a great opportunity for our investors. So this is maybe the the million dollar question or the, the two million dollar question, whatever. Um, you know, if you can paint some fairly granular, like what are you looking for for these companies? And then kind of a corollary. I had something prepared. In general, what are you looking for? And, you know, if you have, here's a multiple choice question. Do you have a preference of like people who are, you know, coming from the large tech firms, Uber and whatnot, or former founders or former investment bankers, um, angel, active angel investors? Is there any like profile Right. that you're seeing is really catching your attention. So two part question or yeah. Right. So uh, for our main fund, we look for fund managers who 
have the credibility to lead their investments because we think ownership is super important. And the quick math example is if you're a spray and pray kind of fund, let's say 100,000 into a bunch of companies, let's say you own 1%, you know, the average exit in venture is 100 million. And so, you know, if you own 1% at exit, that's a million dollars back. Um, if you have a $60 million fund, it doesn't move the needle. But if you're one of our fund managers and let's say has they own 15%, you know, at $100 million, they returned a quarter of their $60 million fund. And so even a small exit, like at $100 million, uh, actually can move the needle. Um, where we focus on uh, when we meet with a new group is we really delve into their networks. Mm -hmm. And because th that gets into sort of how they're going to source their deals. And so if you're someone who is senior at Stripe, then, you know, you have, you're part of the Stripe mafia you know, you might end up seeing a lot of interesting fintech deals or if, you know, so, you know, historically, a number of these fund managers actually came actually out of, um, you know, uh, uh, they were they were founders themselves of startups. And, you know, I think being a founder and um, if, it, actually, if you talk to our, 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 our portfolio funds, they will say that the best source of deal flow is other founders. And, you know, I think, you know, the founders, um, you know, I think uh, whether they, they know each other from school or from just socializing or struggling with their own companies, you know, I think they have a good sense of what it takes and they can see that in other founders and they can see the opportunities that they're trying to create with the, their, their own startups. So, you know, I, I, bottom line though, is we do look at the networks of people. We really delve into where, you know, those nodes are and, um, you know, you can imagine that we already have a lot of portfolio funds. We also don't want to have a ton of overlap. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, for groups that are complementary to, um, to the existing portfolio that we have. But that's the level of granularity that we look at, uh, you know, individual nodes and networks. Interesting. Excellent. Uh, and then you're actually also your multiple choice question. So I, I would say that, you know, the majority of our fund managers are actually ex-founders. Um, and entrepreneurs. So if you look at like late stage funds, like say Tiger Global or like, you know, um, you, you know, Insight, uh, a lot of those groups are actually ex-bankers and lawyers, you know, TCV or IEP. Yeah. Those, those groups, uh, their later stage, they have a lot of ex-bankers and lawyers. At the seed stage, it is actually typically ex-founders because they've been in the trenches and tying it back to the credibility on leading. You know, if you're a founder, you'd want to have a partner who actually has gone through that and can empathize with the, the founder journey. And so that's why I think most seed fund managers are actually ex entrepreneurs. Yeah. Really good. All right. I know time's running late, so I'll make this quick. One, one more last question or, or one or two more last questions. Um, if you had to choose between someone who's got a large network, but very little track record or someone with a track record, but maybe not a profile or brand, you know, is there sort of a, uh, a tipping point there. And then I guess any just general, well, maybe take that. And then I've got one more follow-up question on that. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think the answer is we would look at both, you know, someone with a broad network, you know, I think um, one knock against venture is that it's, there's been a, a, a sort of a prototype or stereotype of a founder, you know, Stanford computer science major. Um, and I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there in the world. There's a new ethos. I think, you know, that Facebook movie kind of kicked it off. People worldwide are like, hey, you know, out of college, I don't have to go to Morgan Stanley or McKinsey. I can actually start a company. And I think that was a sea change in a lot of young people's minds about entrepreneurship. And I'm not, not just in the U.S., but even places like Germany where, uh, or, or, or Singapore. And so, you know, I think it's a worldwide thing. Um, so yeah. broad networks as long as they're actually strong, you know, just knowing 15,000 people doesn't mean anything, you know, um, but, you know, the flip side is if you are very different and you have a different way of looking at things, that also could be super attractive. Our most recent investment is actually to a supply chain and logistics fund in Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm. not a hotbed of venture, but the, the two of the founders are actually uh, had started their own logistics company, sold it. Uh, it was a huge success. They have great domain expertise, plus a great network within supply chain and logistics and, you know, trucking and shipping. So that's a very different profile than, you know, the fund managers we have here in San Francisco. Can you name that fund or is it not announced yet? 
Pardon me? I, I couldn't oh, have... can you name that fund or is it? Oh, yeah, uh... yeah, it's 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 uh, called Dynamo. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, they just announced their fund two weeks ago. That's exciting. All right, one last question, uh, and hopefully you can answer this without further blowing up your email inbox. But <laughs> you know, what's the best way to to approach you? Is it is cold email okay? Is do you really prefer the strong? warm intro approach and any just general general generalities on the process of how how this works right you take a sure. meeting and how does it kind of unfold from there yeah yeah i mean people reach out to me on linkedin um cold emails but uh even on twitter right direct messages but i i, I welcome it all so my email address is michael at sendonacapital.com and if you email me, it might take a little bit of time, but I will respond because we actually do try to meet with every group that reaches out to us. So I would, I would welcome it. And, uh, you know, obviously I have a team as well. So we, we sp- that helps spread the offense. But our philosophy is actually to try to meet every single group because you never know, right, uh, where someone uh, might, might be, you know, it, it might be a cold email. Uh, and it turns out that it was, it was something amazing. Um, and they have something amazing, but, but generally, you know, the ones that we will pro- uh, probably follow up on the first is if one of our investors or one of our portfolio funds say, Hey, we know these, this, this group really well, we think you should take a serious look. And, um, you know, so, uh, there are different ways, as you know, to get in touch with someone, but I would actually very much welcome anyone listening to this to reach out to me at, you know, Michael at sendonacapital.com. With a deck or just a little overview? Do you have a preference on the content? Um, I think a, a high level paragraph. And if you have a deck, that would be great. And, you know, we, we have a specific sort of lens of what we're looking for. Um, but, you know, it, here's the other thing is I, I get I get a lot of emails from placement agents who are sending me like $500 million energy funds, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think th- th- they should be doing their homework. They should know that we focus on seed. So, what I would say is that if you have a seed stage fund, uh, then reach out. But if you're doing series A or later or multi-stage, it's, it's just not a fit. Very last question. I'll let you go. I know we're over time, but something catches your eye. What does the process look like? You know, what are sort sure. of the steps along towards that right. ultimately writing a check? Yeah. Right. So, you know, uh, if something catches the eye, I will respond and say, hey, let's do a call. And we will do an introductory call. I would, we would hear their story. We really like narratives. So it's not so much flipping through a deck because we'll, we'll have read through the deck already. Um, it's really more hearing about their, their own founder journey, why, what, what they did previously, how that set them up to, and the, what, what the catalyst was to starting a fund because a fund is a 10 year plus commitment. Yeah. And so it, 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 you know, I think uh, we really get into the motivations of people of why they want to do this and also what their vision is. What does fund two, what does fund three look like? You know, um, and, you know, so I think we do that first call and try to suss that out. And, and then if it's, if it's interesting, you know, we'll have another one of our partners do a, a, a call to hear that. And then, then we'll actually start calling our network. We'll call people who we know, who know that person. And sometimes it's harder, but generally, I mean, we have a lot of, people within our network. because so we have a lot of fund managers. We have a lot of investors. We have a lot of friends. And so I think even if you're a fund manager in, in Bangladesh, I think there are ways that we could titrate and figure out who, you know, who in our network would know you and be able to get some preliminary feedback. Um, and, uh, and so then if that all looks promising, then we'll spend a lot more time with you. And, um, you know, in the time of COVID, we actually made five or six investments to, to groups that we had never met in person. Yeah. But we're, we're open to that. Um, but, you know, in an ideal world, we would spend time with you in person just to get a release. Uh, it's really more to get a sense of that person and what motivates them and how they view the world. Yeah. Great. Okay. I've kept you long enough. Uh, SendanaCapital.com, Michael Kim. This is super awesome. Thank you so much. Hopefully you can get your, your, your son to robot uh, or uh, coding right. camp on time. Thank you. <laughs> Tell him I apologize. Right. Um, I really, I really, really enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Nathan. All right. Keep, keep up the good work. I'll hit you up in 10 years when I'm ready to raise my fund <laughs> founder suite fund. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, super. Take care.